day of the ninth moon or the ninth uh, lunar period in the year. And, um, as uh, as uh, Chinese history tells us that on the ninth day there was some significant events in, in one particular important person's life where he, he climbed a high hill and he, and he left his village for the day, returned to his village later that day um, to find disaster had struck. And he felt like he had been spared disaster because he'd taken those uh, actions on that particular day. And so it was post hoc ergo proctor hoc, you know, this idea that, you know, so on this ninth day of the ninth moon every year we should do these things. And what it has transformed into is uh, a day for ancestor worship or ancestor respect. So many people visit the graveyard on this day to pay respects to their ancestors. So some, and ancestors in this case, quite specifically, are the ancestors who have passed away or are no longer with us. And uh, they do a couple of different ceremonies. Uh, one is they bring food and they will uh, place the food on the gravesite. Uh, and in, in the past, um, I think people would leave food behind as if it was for their ancestors to be able to eat. But of course that attracts uh, rodents and dogs and that sort of thing. Um, and so now the, the tradition is more of uh, you, you leave the food long enough for the spirit of the food to enter into the afterworld and for the ancestors to be able to eat it. And then you eat it yourself or you take it away, uh, throw it away. One of the other things that they do is they burn joss. Uh, joss is uh, paper forms of all kinds of different tributes. So um, you might burn money, uh, paper money, not real money, but uh, printed money. Um, and you burn that to send, uh, to send offerings to your ancestors in the afterlife. Uh, we also might burn uh, paper figures of actual items that you want your ancestors to have. So you, you may burn a, a, a paper car or a paper mobile phone. Uh, I've seen paper dentures, uh, paper toothbrushes, paper medicine uh, to send to an ancestor. And so that's what they're doing now. The other thing they do, of course, is they burn incense, uh, they burn joss sticks, which is just simply an offering. It's a wax stick, much like a candle, although it burns a lot faster. Uh, this, is, um, this isn't actually even one of the bigger graveyards in Hong Kong, but it's a really good graveyard in terms of uh, feng shui. This area that we're in right now is particularly a good feng shui. You can see that these graves down here below us are angled in such a way so that they can they can see the water. There's a straight view to the water. That's a, that's a fairly that's a fairly important as a grave site. Um, and there's a nice big hill behind us. So one of the one of the best sites for a good feng shui is to have a to have a mountain behind you and water in front of you and with a clear line of sight to the water. Um, yeah, this is really just a traditional day for families to get together and uh, remember their loved ones that have passed away. These cans. Uh, the cans are for burning joss. So in the past, you would come and you would burn joss right at the site uh, every year. Probably will be this year as well. Um, there are brush fires as a result of people burning joss at the at their gravesite. If you look down there at that particular grave right there, you can see there's a good pile of dead leaves right around where the grave is, and we're right next to the local forest. That's tropical jungle right down. And when I looked in the Weather Bureau's website this morning, one of the things I noticed was uh, a big red warning for high risk of forest fire today. Very high risk of forest fire. And that's because they're trying to let people know, hey, listen, there's, there's a risk to going out and burning joss at your ancestors' grave. So now what they do is they provide these cans where you can burn the joss in the can. I, maybe some people might move the can to the actual site of their ancestor's grave. Um, they may just burn it in that location, but it's meant to keep the, the joss burning um, uh, in within control. Now, I see a lot of this red things on top of the graves. Yeah. I guess you can see that there with a the rock on it. What's the significance of that? You know, uh, my understanding of that is it's very much like a prayer. Um, it's a prayer offering, you know, much like uh, uh, the Buddhist monks in, in Nepal will spin a wheel or um, a, a, a Christian may sit down and do the rosary, um, may offer a prayer up to, uh, up to a deity or up to their ancestors. Um, that, that's very much the, the same idea. That's my understanding of it, but not 100% sure. And what. the rock is on it to keep it in place. Yeah, basically that's what the rock is for. It's just keep, there's nothing special about the rock that I know of. It's just meant to keep it in place. And how, yeah. everything's on a hill. Everything is on a hill, and the reason that it's on a hill is so that each particular terrace of graves uh, doesn't have their view blocked uh, to the waterline. So that makes for better feng shui. You can see way over there. Yeah. There's also 
uh, the tiered. Yeah, it's tiered and it's facing uh, it's facing in toward the uh, in toward the ravine. So those those graves down there wouldn't um, have a, as high a value as these graves up here. And you and you can see as well just by the ornamentation of these sites up here. These are quite sophisticated. That one up there looks like it's solid granite, and that's a, a fairly sophisticated um, cover for a grave. If you look down, so down there, it's mostly just headstones. And so there's a clear distinction here. I mean, class and, and wealth brings its way, you know, makes its way into the graveyard as well. The better the feng shui within a grave site, uh, the more valuable that, uh, that, that grave site is going to be. What are we looking at over here as far as the city? Uh, that is actually a Chai Wan. It's right down here in front of us. You see the building says Youth Square on it. That's where Chai Wan is. Uh, that's Sui Sai Wan. Uh, over to the right, we see those uh, three or four or five very large buildings. Um, way beyond that is um, Discovery Bay. You see some really, really large uh, housing complex uh, on the other side there. That's actually on the other side of the um, eastern entrance to Victoria Harbor. And there's another really, really big graveyard over on that other side, looking back towards the water. Uh, which is which has great feng shui as so well. we are in hong kong though we're absolutely right now we're on hong kong island we're on the eastern the most eastern part of, uh, of hong kong island yeah what's that down there is that a school that i would i think is um a, a graveyard for people of the muslim faith yeah. oh yeah that's what i think it is we can go down and check it out and see exactly what it is but i'm pretty sure that's what that is mm. And on our way down, actually, if you can see just in the trees there, you'll see a green roofed building with, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see actually a Christian cross, a Christian cross on that building. That is a graveyard for Christian soldiers that died here during the Second World War. And you can also see up there again, is that another graveyard? Absolutely. That's a, that's a continuation of this graveyard, essentially. And again, terrorist. Uh, so they're in danger of running out of graves? Well, that's a really interesting question. So here's what they do in order to reduce um, running out of grave space. Um, you can buy a grave uh, plot in perpetuity, mm -hmm. and uh, and that will mean that your ancestors can be there indefinitely. But you can also uh, rent a grave spot for a limited period of time. Uh, on average, it's about seven to eight years. And uh, at the end of the seven to eight years, what happens is the, uh, the administrators, you know, the people who run the graveyards, they come back and they dig up your ancestors and then they go through a process that's known as the picking of the bones uh, they smash open the casket the wooden casket by that time almost all of the flesh on the body is gone uh, but the remem remem the remnants of anything that you were buried in so your clothing is still there your jewelry you may have had is all still there and there are uh, women who's in society whose role it is to go through the picking of the bones they will break open the casket and then remove all of the bones from the casket, remove all of the clothing, and everything material is discarded, but the bones are treated with significant respect. Those bones are then placed into a box that's um, about the size, like smaller than a baby crib, you know, like maybe twice the size of a bread box, say maybe two feet long and a foot wide, but they're placed in a very specific pattern. Uh, all of the bones are collected, they make sure that they have all of the bones, and then that box is sealed, and it's put into a building which I believe is called think it uh, what is it called there's a name particular name well in English would be a crematorium or like a so a crematorium no not a crematorium that's where we burn them right. um, a mausoleum a mausoleum yes that's a, I think that might be the right word a mausoleum a more uh, yeah a mausoleum and we'll visit the mausoleums so then the, the, the bones go into a box and then that box goes into a slot in the mausoleum and we'll go and we'll visit and you can visit that and you can visit that instead and you don't have to pay the exorbitantly high rate of a grave in perpetuity. Oh, that is just so fascinating. Yeah. I had no idea. So there are people whose jobs it is to pick the bones. The bones. Yes, and these are very specific women within society who have particular characteristics. I, 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 I don't, rem I don't recall what they are right now, but I do remember reading them at, at, at one time, and and um, and it being significant. This is a, a job that um, can't just be done by anyone because of the reverence that's you know, being paid to the, to the deceased. Wow. Yeah. And you can see the ashes are flying towards us. I don't think you can pick that up on the video from the people who are burning below. Mm -hmm. And this place is absolutely packed. There's just constant stream of people coming in. Um, it's a holiday. This is a day off from work for most people, I guess, except for the people who are out, the police force and the bus drivers. You see there's a bus route here just for today. 
can see the people streaming down here. And this is one of the smaller graveyards, you said. It is. So, it is. and it's it's a big deal to get up here. Also, I read on Wikipedia about the chrysanthemums were extremely um, the important. That was the flower of, I guess, like the poinsettia would be for Christmas. The chrysanthemum is, I guess, the flower of remembrance. Yeah. Um, again, it has something to do with that historical story of the uh, you know the, the significant Chinese character in, in history. Um, whose name I don't recall right now. We, we can fill in those details later for sure. Um, and get and back and find the story. And I'm sure that there are multiple versions of the story as well. Each one creating a different tradition, a different approach to the day. Fascinating. Okay, so David, I see on these black and white photos of all these people on them. In America, yeah, sometimes you see a, a photo or two on a grave, but it's, it looks like just about every one of these has a photo on it. What's Is there a significance to these photos being on the graves? I, I honestly don't know the significance of the photo other than it's probably a, another tradition, um, you know, so that maybe uh, uh, so that uh, ancestors, so that the younger people within your family will definitely remember who you are, remember what you look like. Uh, but I think what's more interesting about the photos uh, is this idea that if something goes wrong with the photo, so if the photo fades over time, um, or if the photo doesn't stick uh, to the grave and it, and it peels off, uh, there there are theories associated with that. Uh, you, you know, no one says that that's just chance, or you didn't use the right adhesive, or you didn't use the right kind of paper. Uh, the theory is that uh, that means that the ancestor is not happy in the afterlife. That that something is something is wrong in the afterlife, or some, or you're doing something wrong in your life, and and your ancestor is trying to send you a message. Uh, so a faded photo, or a removed photo, or uh, any kind of damage to the photo is a, is a signal from your ancestor in the afterlife. You can see people coming in with bags right here. Yeah, so those bags are the well, paper. food and, and paper jobs. Yeah, mostly. mostly and you can see many generations come in through here. We've seen children and yeah. it's a family day. Oh, you'd easily see, you know, three or four generations of a particular family. So if you've had a grandfather who recently passed away, you'd want to come and uh, pay your respects. Your grandmother, you know, his his spouse, mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your parents, you might come yourself and you might have children yourself as well. You would all come to the graves. It's, I mean, it's a, uh, it's certainly an honorable tradition uh, to to respect your your ancestors. Um, it's just, you know, of course, the thing that I always ask myself, I always wonder about. It's like, what is the tradition actually based on? Like, this is one of those traditions that I think has a positive effect, um, other than the brush fires. I think. <laughs> strong and family ties. Yeah, strong family uh, ties. A tribute to people in the past. Yeah. 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 Remembering where you came from, where you're going in the future. Yeah. Remembering what those ancestors did for you. Gathering yeah. to tell stories and to pass on traditions. Yeah. Tell the probably they tell the children who come with them about Grandpa and and the things he did and the things you know what he said and yeah, I'm sure that that and even talk to them, have conversations with them. Grandpa, you know, yeah. Ask them mm -hmm. for advice. Um, and, and a clarity of thought. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, in America, we do it well. In Mexico, well, even in America, we do a Dia de los, Dia de los Muertos, which is very similar to this as well. We, uh, they celebrate family. They have feasts on the graveyards, but of course it doesn't have the feng shui element. I don't yeah. even know if they burn anything, but... So this whole idea of burning things is to be able to send it to the spirit world, is to be able to send it into the afterlife, so that your ancestor uh, will receive it. And that's the way to get it there. So you almost wonder if they actually believe in. this, or if it's just the thing you do. Like um, you put out milk and cookies for Santa. So my, my to pass on the tradition. My limited experience in, in working with uh, members of the local culture, um, you know, uh, local Chinese and local Cantonese and, and local Hong Kongers, so there seems to be a pretty clear demarcation line between um, uh, belief and habit, and it's right around 30 years old. Uh, when I talk to younger people who have gone to Western University, who have studied Western cultures, who are just exposed to Western thought, um, who speak uh, both languages, who speak both Cantonese, Mandarin, and English, you know, they're just exposed to so many different theories and so many different ideas. Uh, those, uh, those younger people tend to still participate in the traditions. They're not opposed to them, but they don't, they don't believe in them the way that uh, maybe their parents do or their grandparents do. Interesting. <laughs> so, you remembered something else about the rocks on the top of the of the grave, okay. right? Right, like. Let's see if I can get a good picture of it. Yeah. Okay. So you remembered something else about the grave? Well, it's it's, it's almost it's a general aspect of uh, of Chinese culture, and it's this concept uh, that the the Chinese refer to as face. 
uh, we would call it saving face. This mm -hmm. idea that it's in, it's important to put a good face for it. It's important for people to know that you've done the right things. And so by having a prominent red prayer card on top uh, of the of the of the gravestone of your ancestor, that lets everyone else know. Uh, because this could be your grandfather, but this you know over here might be your neighbor's grandfather, and that might be somebody who works with you. That might be their grandfather, and they know that's your grandfather's grave, and they want to be able to come in and see. Yeah, you know. They Dave, were here. Dave was here. He duty. paid his respects. Or if they didn't, they would say, "Hey, what's wrong with you?" Yeah. yeah. So Same. maybe is it is it best to get here in the morning so everybody who comes <laughs> maybe, will go. Maybe. Maybe. Now there's lots of people who don't. I shouldn't say lots. Like I said, be, the, the way these myths e evolve in Chinese cultures, there's all kinds of different traditions that emerge from them. So right now we're in Hong Kong, but if we were to go into mainland China, this activity would not be going on in this form. Um, because they don't, uh, um, they don't um, place as high an importance on the ninth day of the ninth month, the ninth day of the ninth moon, the way we do here in Hong Kong. This activity that you see going on here goes on uh, in China in a, in a wide span around this day. So any time, you know, two to three weeks prior to today and two to three weeks after today, you would see people visiting the graveyards when it was convenient, in the evening, on the weekends, right. and performing all the exact same tasks. But they're not, uh, they're not specific about the date that you have to do it. They still do it, but they do it in a different way. Um, and saving faces is even uh, is a much bigger concept in Chinese culture than it is here in Hong Kong culture, although it certainly is part of it. See them opening up the bags. I guess they're going to burn something right there. Yeah, they're going to they're going to burn some jobs. And you can see she's unwrapping some unwrapping some gifts there. Those are that's. Um, who knows what those packages might be, but likely that they're money. It's the most fake common. money. Fake money. Fake money. And there's actually inflation within the fake money as well. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's of course to print fake money. If I print a one dollar bill, if I print a hundred dollar bill, if I print a one million dollar bill, it costs me exactly the same if I'm right. printing fake money. But the one million dollar bills are more expensive at the Joss market. When we go to buy Joss, the one million dollar bills, which are printed on the exact same paper in the exact same manner that the one dollar bills are printed are more expensive and people will pay for them because that's part of saving face. The last thing they want is they want the, the jaw salesman to think they're cheap. Of course I'm going to send my money as much, my family as much money as possible. So uh, a couple of years back there was a Joss, uh, um, a Joss uh, uh, um, uh, a trader, seller, a guy who was selling Joss who actually printed one billion dollar bills and he was selling them at astronomical prices and people were paying for them because they wanted, you know, they wanted their friends to know or they had the ability to send that kind of cash. But nobody really sees it. Um, no, you make a big deal about it. You make sure that you tell your friends. If, if this is part of your personal approach to life, this right. is part of your personal philosophy, you will make sure that your friends know. You'll leave it on your desk at work. You will, you will tell them you're headed down to, and you'll make sure that everybody knows if this is part of your, part of your culture. If it's not, if it's not part of your personality, you won't do it. But you could, uh, you could also, I mean, technically you could take a piece of paper, write one million dollars on it, and then bring it down here and burn it. I was going to say, couldn't you just print it off the internet yeah. or something, a you picture of one? Absolutely, you could. But they don't, they go to they a don't. store. They go to a store, they go to the guys who actually make the Joss. And, and I don't actually, so this information, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of theorizing at this point. It may be possible that within any given culture within China, there's a belief that the person who makes the Joss uh, you know, imbues that joss with with the with the ability to, to send its. I'm sure they keep the that that theory going. Yeah. Because it keeps yeah. them in business. Because yeah. instead of printing it so from if you the. Try, if you try to make your own, you're you're committing some sort of a fallacy. You know, you're you're, you're making a mistake. Not as good. You're not doing what do they right. think the dead's doing with the money? Oh, spending it in the afterlife. Absolutely. They, they have they, stores they, yeah, and absolutely. drive cars well, well, they, and they may, they may brush their teeth. Well, you know, so if you had an ancestor who maybe um, died of a, of a dental infection. Maybe, maybe they had something wrong with their teeth when they died. Uh, and you come back to the grave site years later and the, and the picture has faded. And you're thinking, oh, Grandpa's still suffering from that, from that pain in his tooth. And he, so remember, he had that really bad pain in his tooth before he died. We should send him some toothpaste or a toothbrush, maybe some dental floss. Um, but then the picture doesn't get better. No, they would change the picture. Oh, oh, yeah, because, oh, uh, yeah, because you, you fix the problem. Come on, the afterlife doesn't, it's not that complicated. I, I can send a signal letting you know that I'm upset, but I can't reverse the effect of it. Come on, Susan. <laughs> oh my God, this is fascinating. <laughs> no, you change the picture. That's how you change the what's happening in the afterlife. You put up a better picture. But you, you, you take steps to, to let yourself know that you've taken steps, and then you change the picture.
So these pictures are up here are done by the families. They're put up and re-kept in good shape. You know, I'm sure that that's very similar to the West. No, you, and you have to go and you have to get somebody at the gravesite to, to handle. You don't get to do put pictures on. Okay, I don't. You have to, you have to go through the grave, the, the people who own the gravesite place. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, and they usually embo a lot of them are done ceramically or you know what I was going to say is uh, probably similar to what they do in the West in that you can do it yourself or you can hire somebody but what you're saying is no, I think you West, have to go through the graveyard you have to go through the graveyard and that makes sense that that, keeps, that maintains a standard right make sure people aren't doing crazy things at their gravesite but you can see that there are some you know, some of these grave sites here are fairly uh, sophisticated I mean that one right there it's got some gorgeous feng shui lines um, at the entrance to it. Uh, it's got a cover over it. It's got you know, solid granite walls on either side. So it's got you know, beautiful pillars as an entrance. I mean, the photos are all black and white. Is that because they were taken in black and white? You don't know if it has significance, but they're all black and white. We may see color photos today. I have never seen a color photo. I don't know the significance of black and white. I really don't. Maybe, maybe it's less likely to fade and show the fade. Or it may be easier to print on whatever material it is. Maybe the photo is made of plastic. Um, I doubt that it's made of paper. Clean, respect, yeah. You can see a, a little bit further down along the way past that cedar tree. Those guys have got a good uh, benches to sit on and talk to their relatives. They're under a tree. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great grave site for your ancestors right there. Do they duplicate? I mean, I saw a couple people in one grave. Yeah. But do they, they probably, do a... They probably put husbands and wives in the same grave. Um, I don't know about the idea of... Saves, saves you know, space. Yeah, yeah definitely does. So, um, you know, the... You were just saying they have to reopen the grave uh, when they you know, add, a, add another member of the family to the grave site. Uh, and the idea of opening a grave in Western culture is, you know, so like, oh, why would you do that? It's ghoulish or, you know, you're like... Disrespecting you're disrespecting them. And... Well, and not disrespecting them. There's an actual fear of the dead in Western culture. People mm -hmm. are afraid of dead bodies. They don't, you know, they're, they're afraid of the ghost or the spirit that might be associated with the dead body. Um, in, in Eastern culture, that, that's not often the case. And it's just as often that a ghost or a spirit or uh, someone in the afterlife is, is not mischievous or not a problem, like a zombie or something to that effect. It's actually a ghost or a spirit that, that wants to be helpful and wants to come back and give you good things, wants to give you advice, wants to give you direction. Um, and then, and when you're in the right direction or going in the right direction, they might go away and come back at a later time in your life. Uh, there's this, uh, there's this belief that you know, on the seventh day after a death, um, your your ancestor will present themselves to you in the form of a butterfly or in the form of another um, uh, uh, representation to let you know that everything is okay in the afterlife. Whereas uh, in the West, if we thought we saw the ghost of an ancestor seven days after they died, it wouldn't be something that made us feel comfortable. It would be something that made us feel very upset. That would be, that would be traumatic. Whereas uh, people who see butterflies on the seventh day after an ancestor has passed away are elated. You know, they're, they're like, yes, this is great. I'm seeing the spirit of my ancestor here presented to me in a, in a, in a, in a good way. So the idea of opening a grave and adding another body to it, there's nothing ghoulish about that within this culture. There's no fear of the dead. If you can open a grave seven years later, smash the box that the body was in, and use your bare hands to pick through and extract every single bone, clearly there's no fear of the dead. And, then, and we were talking about the urns. I see them just, why would you have an urn if you're going to be laying it on its side? So it's, it's laid on the side for the majority of the year just to prevent it from filling up with water and going stagnant. So and then they pull it up when they're going to do something like sure. this. Sure. When they come, when they show up with flowers, they would stand it up, put the flowers in it. And then when those flowers died, whoever it is managing the graveyard would come around, remove the flowers, dump out the water, and lay the urn on its side. That's my understanding. I'm, from my, my understanding is that it's just simply a practical thing. There may be another reason for it, but that's all I've been able to discover. So now, do psychics, are they a big deal in in this culture? If you can get your, is it more of a direct conversation with the ancestor if you have a psychic or a medium or something to communicate with I, them? I've never heard of a psychic or a medium in Chinese culture. It may be a phenomenon that I'm unaware of. 
um, but you don't need a psychic or a medium to, to speak to your to your uh, um, to your ancestors in Chinese culture. You can do that on your own. And we had a lecturer at uh, Skeptic Camp this last January. He's from India, and he says you have no psychics. There is just no way because everybody's reincarnated, so there's no one to talk to. So yeah, if you're talking right. to your family member, then there's a problem because they're supposed to have already moved on to some other kind of that's a very good thing. Point. They're already here. They're already there. So yeah. why would you, you couldn't talk to them? So it's a fascinating. Yeah. So to tell somebody in Chinese culture, you'll help get in touch with their, you know, their dead great great grandfather. The response you might get is, why would you need to do that? I, I just spoke with him Tuesday, <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> you know, I just saw him the other day. He was definitely in the form of a butterfly. We were at a picnic. A butterfly came by. I mean, that was clearly granddad. I mean, why would I need a psychic to, to communicate? Wonderful. <laughs> Sort of smiling. There's another one. There's several in here. Maybe they become black and white when they're outside. That's possible. It's also possible that uh, these families of frozen go color because they don't fade. 